Hello, and welcome back to this NextFlow and NFCore online community training event. My name is Chris, and I'm a developer advocate for Secure Labs, and I'll be the one taking you through the training material again today. To start things off, we have a quick recap of what we've done in sessions one, two, and three, and then outline what we'll do today as a part of session four. In session one, we start off with a welcome and an introduction to the NextFlow ecosystem. We got you started with NextFlow by looking at the hello.nf pipeline, and we finished off the session by developing our own proof of concept RNA-seq pipeline. In session two, we introduced you to NF Core, and we looked at NF Core for both users and developers, and some of the tooling and documentation that is available. We finished off the session by looking at NF Core modules and sub workflows and how they can be used and shared between different pipelines. In sessions three, we started to look at some of the things that were introduced as a part of session one and two in more details. So we looked at managing dependencies and containers, channels, processes, and operators. We gave you more of an introduction to Groovy, and we looked at modularization of processes. In session four, we'll continue to re-examine some of the things that have been reintroduced previously, such as configuration, deployment scenarios, the cache and resume, and we'll talk about some ways that you can troubleshoot errors with your pipelines. We'll finish off the session by getting you started with NextFlow Tower. If you have any questions during this event, we have a number of Slack channels that are available, and we have a great group of community volunteers who will be there to help you during the event. Okay, so let's get started. If you're going to head back over to the training material uh, at training.nextflow.io. Okay, so here we are back on the Nextflow training website. What I would like everyone to do again is go and open up a Gitpod environment that we can use for this training again today. I have already opened a new window over here uh, just to keep things moving. I've already done this. And one thing that I will do is I'm going to, again, just export the version of Nextflow so that uh, we are using this particular version. As you can see, it's just downloading everything again. Um, as a reminder, this is because this is a whole new environment. I haven't been using the same environment from day to day. Uh, every day I've been creating a new environment. Um, so you're very welcome to either reopen one that you've already used uh, or use a new one just like me. Okay, so back in the training material, again, we use this basic next load training workshop. So we can click on start and then we can go down here to the configuration uh, page. Okay. So what you might remember from session two is that NextFlow will look for the configuration files in a number of different places. And all of these are kind of interrogated in a hierarchy. All of this is because NextFlow is actually decoupled the workflow from the configuration so that you can quickly and easily modify your pipeline without needing to actually modify your code base, making it very portable uh, and hopefully easy to configure. So as a reminder, over here on the configuration, uh, documentation. So this is in the nextflow.io docs. Um, if you just look for nextflow documentation configuration in your favorite search engine, uh, this is the page that should come up. Here is a list of the hierarchy. So the things, uh, the different configuration files and how they are sort of uh, used in this order. So for example, things that you write in the command line with a flag, overwrite things that are in the params file or a configuration file you specify with the minus C. Also, the nextflow.config in your current directory, uh, which is higher than your workflow uh, project directory. Uh, also, the home config file and things that are in your main.nf. Again, this is all um, so that you can easily decouple what you've written in your workflow from your pipeline uh, from the actual configuration. So going back to the documentation uh, over here, um, 10.1.1 is about the configuration syntax. So what you might remember um, from our configuration file already, uh, we have this dot notation. So process dot container docker dot run options. Process and docker are both different scopes. So we have a number of different scopes listed down here that you can use uh, to configure your pipeline. So here, for example, if we were to look at the docker scope, uh, these are all the different things that you can include uh, or configure as a part of this. Similarly, if you look at the parameters, uh, we have a number of different options here, um, and we have some more information about how these need to be written here. But going back to the training material, uh, what we can see here um, is that for 
the configuration syntax. It can be simply what you're configuring as well as the value. So here we have this process.container. So we're configuring the container for the process scope. And we've specified that with an equals and the name of the container. Here we have the Docker scope and we are configuring the run options. And all of this has been simply written with um, the scope, the option, and equals, and, and what we're actually configuring just like this. Um, here is a number of examples. So 10.1.2 is an actual, um, a few examples, property one, another property, and a custom path. Um, some of them have used the, um, the usual uh, property name with the, the dollar sign um, as a variable here. Um, here we've got the, the dollar sign with the, um, the curly brackets to wrap up the expression. Um, so this is just an example of using uh, the actual uh, configuration as a, using variables in your configuration. Um, 10.1.3, this is just a, um, a comment about using comments again. Um, we've looked at this a couple of times already, but you can add in um, comments quite easily with a with a double double slash. Um, or of course, you can also use the, the multi-line um, approach here. One thing we haven't really discussed is using the configuration scopes. So this is when we actually have, um, you might have multiple um, things that you want to configure as a part of one scope. So instead of writing, as an example, docker.enabled, docker.container, as we've done previously um, here. So what we've done previously is we, we were written docker.enabled equals true. You can actually write this using um, the scope like this. So this is when you use curly brackets and you can just wrap all of this up um, under the docker scope. And you could write run options equals this. And then enabled equals true. So what we have here, that should be a capital O. Um, and what we have here, so lines four and five and seven through 10 um, are effectively the same. So we could delete those at this point um, and everything would still run the same. We could also do the same thing here where we do um, that, for example. So what we're looking at here under 10.1.4 um, is just how you can sort of write these um, either um, as individual lines or by grouping them in the same scope using the curly brackets notation as listed here. Okay, um, something we've also talked about previously in, in slightly different ways at different times is the parameters and how they can be configured um, in different ways and also overwritten in the command line. So here we have an example um, of two parameters, so params.foo and params.bar. What we have here is they have been set um, both in a configuration file and the workflow script. So this is will be an example of how we can overwrite what we have in the script with a configuration file. And then I'm assuming um, what we can do down here as well is, yep, um, we're going to show that you can actually overwrite this in the command line as well. So um, as a reminder, we'll set this up. So we can go here. Um, I'm just going to overwrite this snippet.nf rather than create um, a new file. So here we have the params.foo and the params.bar. Um, here we're just printing those lines um, to the screen. We will create a configuration file. So I think what we're going to do here is actually put these into the uh, configuration file, which we've already modified. Uh, so here it's got params.foo and params.bar. So now down at my command line, I'm going to do next flow run, and then we'll do the snippet.nf. So this is a little bit different to what we have written in the uh, training material. This has been written as params.nf. Um, I haven't done that. I've just called it snippets. I'll put it into the snippets.nf file. And what we can see is that we have Bonjour Le Monde, um, because this is overwriting. The configuration file is overwriting what was already in the snippet.nf because it is higher in the hierarchy. Similarly, we can overwrite this again by just specifying this in the command line. So remember, uh, when we have two dashes, this is a next flow pipeline option or parameter rather than a next flow um, parameter or option. So we're going to overwrite foo with um, something or something else. And we're going to run that again. 
So this is just running again. Um, and you can see here that I've overwritten foo. So foo was something, a parameter, so I could overwrite this as a parameter in the command line. Um, and this has been overwritten, which is overwriting what was in the configuration, which is overwriting what was in the main.nf file. So you can see here that you can stack your configurations on top of each other and modify things at different levels. So it is really important that you do remember this hierarchy and how things are brought in, and that if something is coming in at the wrong time, it might be because it's in the wrong um, in, the, in the wrong file and it's being overwritten somewhere else. Okay, um, so we also have some options here about configuring uh, an environmental scope. So this allows the definition of one or more variable that will be exported into the environment where the workflow task will be executed. So again, here we have an example, uh, which I'm going to include these in the configuration file, which I've been adding to already. <clears throat> so these can stay here, that won't cause any, um, any problems for us. We now have this process foo. Uh, this has been written in lowercase letters, that should probably be updated to uppercase um, the next time that we're editing these documents. Uh, we have a script block here. Remember that scripts are with the three singular quotes rather than the double quotes. Um, we've also got this echo true. Um, echo is actually being depreciated, and we're going to change that to debug. So jumping back over here to snippet.nf, um, I'm going to change this to debug. Um, so echo was something that was used in the past. Um, this little bit of documentation looks to be out of date. Um, so debug equals true. Um, we are going to have, um, this is a script block, so just to, uh, this is a shell block rather. So what I can do there, oh, a few typos. Um, I'm just going to label that there for a sense of uh, familiarity with what we've done previously. I'm going to add a workflow block down here, which we are going to take foo. Um, and in this environment, whatnot, we won't give it any inputs because we don't have any inputs specified as a part of our process. Um, all it will have to work with is what we have specified alpha and beta um, as a part of this environmental uh, scope here. So when I run this, um, again, this will just be snippet.nf. The foo parameter is now irrelevant because we won't uh, use that as a part of the script. It isn't being included anywhere. What we can see is we've got beta equals um, the home to the get pod path and alpha has been set to some value. So going back to what we have here, you can see that uh, home, so this is the home directory, um, this is from the environment, um, we have some path, so home git pod, this is um, the home git pod, so workspace um, git pod, um, the same thing that we have uh, happening here, so this is all from um, the home directory, if you were to do echo home, um, you'd see that there as well. Um, so when we run this, um, these are being included as environmental uh, scopes. Or well, these are a part of the environmental scope. Um, of course, over here in the documentation, um, there's some more information about this here and how this can work. Um, there's a note there as well as a warning. Okay, um, so this is effectively what I've already run. Um, this is just a slightly different um, way to view it, um, as well as the results that we were um, expecting. Okay, so 10.1.7, this is the config uh, for processes. So the process directives allow the specification of settings for the task execution, such as CPUs, memory, um, and your container. So this is something that we have already um, sort of touched on a little bit um, as a part of, um, uh, excuse me, NF Core. So as an example of this, if you were to go and look into a repo or a module, um, we're just going to look at Airflow just because it's sitting there. Um, when we look at these modules, you can actually see that some of this has been specified um, as a part of the process. Um, so here, for example, we already have a container. Um, in this case, we don't actually have um, the CPU allocation, but it has been given a label, uh, which is something we'll talk about again very soon. So um, here's the example of just sort of setting this all as part of your process scope. We have CPUs, memory, and container. 
so that when you execute um, your processes, it will have 10 CPUs and memory of eight gigabytes. Um, and this will be the container that would be used. Um, and here's just a note as well. Um, so the process selector can be used to apply the configuration to a specific process or group of process. Um, and again, this is kind of what um, I've already mentioned pre or just now as a part of NF Core, um, is that we will discuss this a little bit later when we talk about labels. Um, okay, so here, for example, we have the process foo, um, and the memory has been given four gigabytes times the task or the number of tasks CPUs. So something we used as a part of um, we used as a part of developing our RNA seq proof of concept pipeline um, was tasks.cpu. So what you might remember is that um, as a part of that task um, execution, when we looked at the um, scripts. Um, what you might remember is that we use this task um, dot CPUs or dollar sign task dot CPUs, um, and this would automatically um, detect the number of CPUs that we wanted to use um, and include that as a part of the actual script that was executed. As a part of this as well, um, we actually modified this uh, in session one. So here, um, this is an example of you can actually generate this number dynamically. So you can define a config setting by using the dynamic expression uh, for a closer in a closer closure. Um, so here, for example, we have four um, gigabytes of memory per task CPU. So this would uh, multiply based on the number of task CPUs that you've allocated. So for example, if you were to say tasks um, or CPUs equals two, um, you would have eight gigabytes of memory allocated uh, in that process foo. Um, here's just a little note about um, if you require more than one value, um, such as using pods or the Kubernetes, um, you can express this as a map object like this. Um, similarly, um, we've got process container. So this is, um, as an example, you can include um, a particular container for a particular process. Um, this is something that has been shown already when we use this as a part of um, here, for example, uh, we've got process container next to RNA seq. Uh, NF, so this was a container with everything already in it. Um, and over here, we also show that you can do, um, you can sort of generate this dynamically based on a particular process um, and have a little bit of logic to decide uh, which um, which particular container should be using, um, as well as if you should be using it with Singularity uh, or Docker. Um, the way this is written is potentially a little bit more advanced um, than we've actually shown as part of this training. Um, this is a really common way of writing everything as a part of NF Core, um, but something I think is just a little bit outside of the scope um, of what we're doing as a part of this training, um, but something you will get quite familiar with if you are doing a lot of uh, NF Core pipeline development. Um, okay, so um, down here again, we've got this process container. Um, this is an example of actually using a singularity, um, singularity file, an image rather than a Docker container. Um, both of these, the, the actual way you write this is very similar. Um, it's quite a hard one to demonstrate um, live because um, we don't have Singularity installed in the Docker, excuse me, in the GitPod environment, but something else you can do. Um, again, we've got an option down here to actually use Conda. Um, going back to the example I've pulled up here, you can see that you've got this, um, this option here to use Conda. Um, so if params enable Conda is true, um, you would use this image otherwise. Um, you wouldn't. Um, similarly, we've got some some logic in here, sort of saying use this image or that image based on if you're pulling it from um, Singularity, um, and if you wanted to use Singularity or Docker. Okay, um, so that's everything that is really included as a part of the configuration uh, part of this this training material. Like I said, though, I do really encourage you to go and have we browse around the documentation. Um, so there's a lot of information here about how you can write this and include this as part of your processes and, of course, part of your workflow um, or your wider workflow or pipeline, um, depending on what you want to call it. Um, and this is really, really valuable um, information because there's a lot of ways that you can modify the execution of your pipeline uh, to make it very portable, um, which I think is really important. Okay, um, so that's the end of the section for configuration. Um, and we will now jump over to deployment scenarios. 
So here we talk about deployment scenarios, and this is where some of the configuration stuff that we've just mentioned um, becomes a little bit more interesting um, and probably a slightly more applied way. So um, putting this in context, and excuse me, in context, um, in real world genomic applications, um, you might need to execute thousands of jobs using very large files. Um, in this scenario, batch scheduler is um, commonly used to deploy a pipeline um, on a large computing cluster. Uh, because you wouldn't have the resources locally uh, on your laptop, for example. Um, as such, it allows the execution of many jobs in parallel across uh, many compute nodes. So all of those, those tasks, all of those processes are kind of just farmed out um, across your many sort of compute nodes across, across your cluster. Nextflow has built-in support for this, um, for all of the commonly used batch schedulers, um, so such as um, Grid Engine, Slurm, um, IBM, LSF, for example, um, as well as there's a lot of um, cloud platforms that are supported now as well. Thinking about your cluster deployment, um, you can have your script, which is decoupled from your config. Um, both of these kind of feed in together, and based on the config, you can specify if your script should be deployed locally um, or on a batch scheduler. Um, alternatively, there's some there's a cloud option included here as well. To run your pipeline with a batch scheduler, all you need to, to do is modify the next loader config file, uh, specifying the target executor, um, and the required computing resources if needed. Uh, for example, you've got process.executor equals slurm, uh, which would send it to the slurm execute, uh, slurm uh, scheduler. Um, what you can do here uh, as a part of process, um, you can see a lot of examples here. Again, this is under the Nextflow documentation. Um, this is an example if you're using um, the grid engine, for example, you can specify the executor as well as um, the queue and the cluster options. And there are lots of different sort of process things you can set as a part of the process scope, um, depending on what uh, what executor you are using. Um, going back to the material here, um, there's a lot of examples. Um, so you can use queue, CPUs, memory, uh, time, and disk. Um, all those examples of, of how you can, can specify the amount of resources that you want to allocate to a particular uh, pipeline. Um, again, this is just looking at it again, um, process to execute a slurm on a short queue with um, 10 gigabytes of memory, um, maximum 30 minutes, um, CPUs um, four. So this would be um, requirements for all processes in your workflow application, um, meaning that would be applied to everything. However, that might be fine for some sort of simple, uh, some simple pipelines, some simple workflows, um, but in reality, you might need to allocate different resources for different parts of a pipeline. And for this, you can use things like with name or with label. Um, so looking at this with name, um, we've got this process here. It's being sent to the Slurm executor on the short queue with 10 gigabytes of memory in 30 minutes um, with four CPUs. But using the with name, um, where you can select um, with or process with the name foo or bar um, in this case, you can say that you want to use two CPUs with um, 20 gigabytes of memory in the short queue for foo and four CPUs with 32 gigabytes of memory in the long queue for bar. So you can basically choose the resources for each process, meaning that you can come up with these really sort of um, awesome ways of deploying your pipeline and all the different processes and they have different resources, meaning that um, while a simple process and it doesn't require much, uh, many resources can be done quickly on a short queue. Uh, for things that are particularly more complicated and require many resources, uh, you can send that to uh, a long queue with more resources. Um, so here, this is actually quite a cool exercise um, where we can allocate uh, the process with the name quantification, um, two CPUs and memory of five gigabytes. Um, this won't quite work because this is uh, probably labeled differently to what we've got over here as part of these scripts. Um, so to show you how to do this, I'm just going to remove that. Um, so again, this is just in my nextflow.config under the process scope. Um, I'm going to add in, um, so the processes with name quantification. And then I'm going to change this to um, five CPUs and uh, 10 gigabytes of memory, which is more than it had previously. Um, all of this has been wrapped up with the um, with name quantification inside these curly brackets, um, which is the same as here. I've just moved um, all of this within a process uh, scope that was already as a part of my config file. So what I can do is nextflow run script 
seven. Um, Docker is enabled. I don't need that. That's uh, that can be removed. And I'm just going to run that. So you'll see that all of this is running, which is great. Um, what I will do though, is we will interrogate um, what was actually run as a part of uh, process quantification by going into that task um, work directory. So here, I'm just going to go cat uh, into the work directory um, here, which is the hash number generated for that task, dot command dot sh, to actually see what was executed. What we're expecting here is that five CPUs would have been allocated um, and you can see that here, threads five. So going back to the script, this is what we'd expect here. Um, salmon quant threads um, task.cpus because we have to find this here for the process with the name quantification. Um, we've got five CPUs. So this is again quite a simple example, but you can imagine how this could be um, sort of built on and then based on what you're um, trying to do, what you're trying to um, provide for a particular process or task. Um, these, these resources could be um, created quite dynamically as well. Um, here, so um, this is an example of um, using labels. So we've used labels quite extensively as a part of NF Core. Um, so what you might remember is um, over here, I'm just going to go to uh, a pipeline. We will just look at this one because it's at the top. We'll go to the Git repository. Um, here we can look at the modules. We'll look at the NF core module. Um, use gunzip um, in the main. Here we've got these labels. And these labels are based on what have already what has already been included as part of the NF core template. Um, and here as part of the configuration file for base. Um, you can see here that we have these different labels uh, which have been uh, designed to allocate different resources. Um, here, in this case, it's it's um, kind of scaling. So for every task attempt, it is going to increase um, the number of CPUs and memory um, and time allocated for these these processes. So this is where the kind of dynamic um, execution can come in. Uh, anyway, um, going back over here, we've got this process um, task one, for example, which has the label long versus task two, which has the label short. Um, meaning that you would have these different um, these different CPU memory and queue um, sort of resources allocated um, as a part of this process configuration. Um, and that's exactly what's happening over here as a part of these NFCore pipelines as well. Um, so this is very cool because it means that you can kind of create one configuration um, or one label and apply it to a lot of your processes, um, which is good because it just saves you from having to sort of specify all of this um, every time, every process, you can just say, okay, this is um, requires high memory consumption. I want to apply my high memory uh, label. Um, similarly, um, something that we do as a part of NF Core is that you can provide um, specific containers for specific processes. Um, so here, for example, we have the, the process foo and bar. Um, these probably would be capital letters or uppercase letters um, because that's um, how I would name them as processes. Um, but we've got the container um, other image uh, Y and other image, or some image X um, for each of these separately. And these will be used because Docker is, is enabled. Um, you can see that we kind of have uh, this happening over here in NF Core as well. And that we have again over here in the modules folder. Um, I'm just going to put the NF Core uh, gunzip main. Um, we've got here the Conda uh, environment um, and over here, or well, the Conda, uh, Conda tool. Um, and here we have information about the um, containers that would be used for Singularity and Docker um, as a, for this particular process. Um, okay, so um, down here as a part of 11.3, we talk about configuration profiles. So we've used profiles a little bit, um, especially as a part of uh, session two, again, when we're using the NF Core, uh, we're exploring the NF Core pipelines and tooling and functionality. Um, we were using the um, the Docker profile, um, you can create profiles which have set um, set information. So again, like with the um, NF Core uh, pipelines, for example, we have test profiles. Um, so here, 
just to show this again, we have like this test.config and this is included um, as a part of the nextflow.config and this has already got some input um, information and parameters already set, um, which can be executed as profiles. Um, similarly, we have, um, again, like this base config, which has all the information about the uh, different labels. Um, we also have like this modules config, which has um, sort of set information using the width name for each of the different modules that are included as part of this pipeline. Um, again, all this can be included um, as profiles. Um, what I'm trying to sort of show here is that you can um, create these really um, interesting and important um, webs of profiles and configuration sort of parameters um, that can be included uh, quickly and easily by using things such as um, profile in the command line. Um, again, it's a little bit harder to show um, because we would execute this on the cloud, for example, which isn't set up as a part of the Gitpod environment. Um, on the topic of cloud deployments, um, we have some information here under 11.4 um, about how you might set up AWS Batch. Uh, a little bit of information there. Again, this isn't set up um, using Gitpod, but um, some examples of what you'd need to include there, um, as well as how you'd um, use volume mounts for your, for your data. Um, again, we've got some information here about custom job definitions. Um, this isn't really um, that demonstrable, or I can't show this as a part of the GitHub environment. Uh, custom images are a little bit hard as well, um, as well as launch templates. But if you are interested in any of this, um, this is a really nice place to start uh, for setting up um, cloud deployments. Um, here is just a quick note on hybrid deployments, um, which I think is probably worthwhile just um, discussing. So here, for example, we have um, process executor slurm and queue short, um, which would be applied to uh, your pipeline. But here we have with label big tasks. So if you were to apply a label to a process, um, here you would send it to the executor um, AWS batch with the queue, uh, my batch queue and the container, uh, my image tag. Um, basically what this is showing is that you can have a hybrid deployment, meaning that say you were running this locally and you got to a process that required much more computational resources than you have available as a part of your cluster, um, you could dynamically have this um, sent to a cloud by adding uh, this label, um, which is cool because it means that you could even run something locally on your laptop and then if it is a particularly difficult task or process, you could have it sent to um, the cloud or um, even to um, an HPC system uh, relative to your, to your local device, um, which is cool. Okay, uh, so moving on. Okay, yes, uh, execution, cache, and resume. So this will help bring together a few things that I've mentioned at different points about um, when I was poking around the work directory. Um, this will come up again a little bit in troubleshooting, um, but Understanding how the cache and resume functionality works will really sort of bring together a few um, different things that we've talked about at different times. So the next load caching mechanism works by um, assigning like unique IDs um, to every task that is executed. So you have your process and as, as the channels are full with information, so as every different file comes through, a new task is generated. And the task will have this, like I said, a unique ID, um, which is a 128 um, bit hash number um, composing of a task input values files um, and the command string is, is written here. Um, so um, as we've seen previously, that when you sort of have your, your work directory, um, everything is generated in this work directory, and we have this, um, this 128 uh, bit hash number, uh, which will have everything staged, so everything coming in from your channels, um, everything that's been included as part of your parameters um, will be there. It is all staged and made available for the process task execution. The process will, uh, the task will run. Um, everything is contained in that folder, in that, um, in that effectively environment, everything is there um, and it's all contained. Um, and as such, um, this, this hash number uh, kind of incorporates all this information um, there's a little bit of information here about using tree. Um, I could show you this here, but it's going to be a little bit of a mess um, because I have run um, lots of different processes. So there's there's lots of um, lots of files here included as a part of 
um, the work directory, which is already there. I guess it's not too bad, so um, you can explore this probably a little bit more. Uh, but here, for example, you can see that this D6 um, hash number has um, all of the files incorporated into it um, that is needed for the execution of that, that task. Um, so all the files have been staged with, with some links um, and some of the things have been generated um, are there as well. Um, which is cool. Again, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more when we talk about troubleshooting. Um, but just for now, it's important to remember that everything um, is, is sort of brought into that process, um, which is named based on uh, that, that hex, uh, that 28-bit, um, 128-bit uh, number. So um, how does resume work? The resume command line option allows um, the continuation pipeline from the last step that was completed successfully. Um, but practically what's actually happening is that next flow will start from the start again, but it'll go through and it will test if these uh, these work directory folders based on the hash number, um, the bit number is um, exists, and if it's been modified in any way, if it's exactly the same and that, that number is the same, then it'll say this is cached, I don't need to rerun it, and it'll move on to the next part of the pipeline, uh, so the next task um, or process. Um, this is probably uh, worded a little bit nicer here, um, which says that um, you know, have it before launching, the execution of the process, next I use as the task unique ID to check if the work directory would exist and if it contains the valid uh, command exit state uh, with the expected output files. Um, so that's something I did miss out, is that it is actually checking to make sure that um, the exit state um, was, was, um, wasn't was an error. Um, so if it's satisfied, the task execution is skipped, um, the computer results um, are used as the, the process results. So, um, as I've just mentioned as well, all of this is sort of um, generated in the work directory. Um, the work directory by default is just in the um, directory that you're sort of operating in. So like if I was to move back um, here, for example, so I'm actually um, sitting in a slightly different directory here, um, one back from this um, NF training folder. Um, if I was to run Nextflow run um, NF training uh, script seven, um, we could run that. And we'll see that we will create a new work folder um, in the current folder, in the current directory. So all of this will run because it's all, um, everything is relative to the, um, the script, uh, uh, the, the execution script, uh, the next flow script rather. Um, so now if we look at this again, you'll see that we have this work directory uh, which will have just um, the files that were generated uh, right now as a part of uh, that, that execution. Um, alternatively, you can actually use this W uh, minus W, um, the command line option to set um, a different directory for your work uh, directory to be generated. Um, I think it's quite common that people set this to scratch, for example, so that it's happening in the scratch rather than a um, a folder higher up in your um, directory where the files need to be passed up and down um, more frequently. Um, cool, yeah, so here's just another note about um, how that hash code is um, generated. So it's, it's based on the complete file path, the, the file size, um, the last modified timestamp. Um, and this is actually quite a nice um, point or an important point is that even just touching a file will invalidate uh, the related task execution. So for example, um, I can go back here, uh, remembering this is in the, um, the directory. Um, we're not in the NF training folder. Um, this is the one that I've just executed outside of that. So if I was to um, just view one of these um, or touch one of these, let's do the, um, what's a good one? Let's do this. Um, so I could just do touch. Now, if you were to resume this, um, this wouldn't work because this is, this, um, or it shouldn't work because it's been touched, uh, meaning that we have a different timestamp and that the resume functionality won't work. So you can see here that the index was still um, cached and that was fine because I didn't, the process I have modified didn't impact on the index process, 
So I was only touching the um, the, um, the 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 gut sample, the gut FQ file, meaning that when it was indexing the .fa file, um, which has nothing to do with the quantification step, but it does, but it doesn't um, use the uh, uh, .fq file. Um, it was completely separate. Um, so I'll move back into there. Uh, so just showing that I've moved back into this NF training uh, folder there. Okay. Um, we'll keep moving on with the um, training material. 13.3, um, this is quite an important point. Um, there's good practice to organize each experiment into its own folder. Um, the main experiment and put parameters should be specific to that um, using config, next row config file. Um, that just makes it a little bit easier to replicate over time because you can have um, configs and other things just stored um, with your data. Um, something that we haven't spoken about at all is this next flow log command, um, which is quite cool. So this is kind of like a way to look at all of your previous executions and potentially resume um, a process that you have used um, previously. Um, so I've just shrunk this a little bit, so it's a little bit smaller now, um, but it's nice to see um, everything on the same line. We'll try to see everything on the same line. Shrink that up again, does that help? Not really. Okay, that's a little bit better. Um, so here, um, by default, what's generated is it shows you the timestamp, the duration, the run name, the status, the revision, the session ID, and the command. Um, and all of these are sort of uh, produced in order. What you can do, um, which is quite cool, um, so the things that happened outside of this folder aren't included here. Uh, there's, this is only the stuff that included inside the nf uh, training dot nf hyphen training folder nf dash uh, training folder. Um, what you might want to do is you go next flow. Um, going back to the sample here, you can see next flow run rna seek um, dot nf. For us, we're going to use something like script. Um, script seven again, um, where we can go resume Mighty Boyd. So we can kind of pick up most of this information from here, for example. Uh, so we can go next flow run script seven. So it's exactly the same um, script that we've run down here. Um, I want to use drunk Tesla um, being the, the script that was run here. What I can do is go resume with that particular name, so the run name. But let's say I now have a new sample and I want to rerun this this process, this script. Um, I want to rerun this pipeline rather. Um, so I could go reads. So again, going back here, we can see that um, the reads parameter is set here. I am actually going to copy this and create a relative path and change this to the glob. So when this was run previously, it was only for the gut samples. Now when I rerun this, this drunk Tesla being the run name with the reads now including extra samples, what we should see, or I hope to see, is that this will be run, but now with, um, oh, so I need to actually put a dot there. Let's try that again. Uh, this will run again. Um, it's picking up on this cache information. Um, this here because I have potentially modified that sample, it hasn't picked it up. So this isn't a particularly good example, um, but it's an example how you can go back and reuse um, information, uh, reuse sort of the start of a run. It's going to use the files that were cached um, previously and the files that already exist in your work directory um, and sort of just start and redo the process that it needs to. But anything that has been modified um, won't, be, uh, won't be able to be cached or re-included. Um, so here, um, we have a little bit of information about the execution provenance. The log command when provided with the run name or session ID can return many useful bits of information. Um, so again, what I could have done uh, here. 
So again, just using um, Nexo log with the name of the execution. So next flow um, log. Uh, we will just take information here about this. Um, actually, we'll do this one here, um, which might be a little bit more interesting. Next flow log, we can put in that name. And this will give us information about, uh, should have given us information about the um, the process that was run or the uh, pipeline that was run. Okay, okay. So I think that was a bad example because um, it actually um, cancelled out. But what we can do is we will just replace this uh, with a different name of a run that's um, completed and it'll give us information about all of the different work directories uh, that were generated as a part of that. Um, what you can actually do is kind of build on this and ask for specific pieces of information about um, each each task, each process um, by adding in something like this. So this is just actually adding, asking for the process, the exit, the hash, and the duration um, of each of those. And you can see here that we've got uh, that information. So the process, the exit, the hash, and the duration uh, will print it out um, for each of these. Um, here you can ask this to be printed out in a different format um, if you're trying to do something else with it or, or put it something through some sort of um, plotting. Um, here, so this is this is quite a useful resource for anyone that is um, trying to troubleshoot. So 13.5 is about the regime um, troubleshooting. Um, so this is just a list of things that might have changed, which might have impacted um, the execution of your um, resume. So if the input file has changed, um, a process um, has modified the input, um, inconsistent file attributes. Um, so if you have a um, shared file systems uh, may have um, some slightly more complicated um, file um, sort of labeling, uh, the file attributes, uh, race conditions. So this is an example where um, basically the, the, the variables, um, X for example, um, race, and um, you might find that they appear in different orders um, you can always just show this. So I'm just going to put this into snippet.nf. Um, so here we have channel one, two, and three, and we're mapping those um, to x um, and then x plus two. So when you have channel one that equals um, it, and channel two we have it, um, because it's specified x, we can get this um, basically um, effectively race conditions. So that's a pretty bad explanation. So next flow uh, run snippet.nf. So again, what we're going to expect here is channel uh, one. Um, so we've got three, four, and five, which is for one, two, and three, we'd expect it to be um, x plus uh, equals two. Um, and here we've got x equals it, and then x times equals two. So you'd expect that these numbers um, would scale differently. But you can see here that we've got channel one equals three, channel one uh, equals four and channel one equals five and then we've got two four and six but if we actually um, use the def um, keyword to declare the variables as local meaning that these two don't interfere we'll see that we get different results um, so we can leave that there i'll just add that there again all we've done is add this um, def uh, so we're defining that as a local variable meaning that it won't um, interfere with any of the other um, process executions task executions. Oh, what's happened there? Uh, yeah, so the, that code block hasn't been updated properly either. Um, so if we change that to view um, and look at it again. So you two, three, four, or so channel one, we have three, four, and five, which is three, four, and five. But here we have channel two, which is two, four, and six, which is what we'd expect um, for the multiplication of one, two, and three. Whether here we have two, uh, four, and six, I guess that is actually, um, it's not a particularly good example because the race conditions have worked out uh, as you might have hoped initially. Um, but just to actually demonstrate this again, uh, I'm just going to copy this out. Uh, to show you that you do um, get different results.
always love it when a um, example works out when it shouldn't. Two, four, and six, still working. Okay, so here we've got six, uh, four, and six. Um, so it hasn't actually worked out that time. So it's just because there is race conditions, uh, the first couple of executions worked out, uh, which um, isn't a particularly good example. Um, but what I was trying to show here is that by adding this, um, the def keyword to define this um, as a local, declare this rather, um, as this, this variable is local. Um, the final thing is non-deterministic uh, input channels. Um, which is when you have uh, two or more channels, each of which is the output of a different process, um, the overall input ordering is not consistent over executions. So that just means that um, unless there's anything to kind of um, tie these things together or make sure that they are being emitted um, at the right time in the right place, um, you can have um, non-deterministic uh, sort of outputs, um, which is shown here as well. Um, so really just what's, what's happening here is that you've got, um, effectively you've got this pair coming in, but because there's nothing to uh, join this or, or group this um, here, such as a tuple, um, this might not be the file that you'd expect it to be. Um, I'm just going to check if this would actually run. No, probably not without a workflow script. Um, but the, the point of this here is that because the output um, is the pair and the BAM file and the BI file, so the, ref the, um, the reference, the index rather, um, they will come in at different points. Um, if you have multiple files, no guarantee that they'll be emitted in the same order, uh, meaning that they might um, just sort of turn up and be included in this gather process without it um, in a different order, um, which isn't a good thing. Okay, um, moving on to troubleshooting. Okay, so here we are for troubleshooting. Um, I have demonstrated some of this stuff um, in slightly different ways, um, sort of through the, the last three and a half sessions now. Um, what I'll do now is kind of go back and, and sort of talk about some of this in more detail and talk about what's actually happening in some of those hidden uh, next five files that are generated in the work, um, work directory. So um, when you have an error, um, you might get an error message like this. Um, here's an example of the, the different lines that you might expect to find. Um, this is the, the near message that we expected from um, one of the earlier scripts that we used in session one. So um, it is caused by a description of the error case, uh, the command executed. This is what was actually um, executed in the command.sh um, file, which we've looked at a couple of times. Um, the exit status, the output, um, if anything was output, and um, if it was empty, it's labeled as empty, um, as well as a line that you might have um, the line that caused this uh, this error. Um, so um, what you can actually do, um, and as we've done previously, is go into the work directory and look at the different um, execution directories. Excuse me, the execution directories contain these files. And we can go and look at these files, uh, these command, uh, these hidden command files to see what was actually run and um, try and understand why a particular process failed. So uh, what I will do um, is we will just clear this. Um, I'm just going to clear my work directory just to make it a little bit cleaner. Um, and we're going to run this one here. We're not going to resume. Um, we will just run this outright for the first time, just like this. So what we can see here is all of the uh, processes um, have been executed, all the tasks being executed are being executed now. Um, this is creating different work directories. The first one here, for example, is this um, 97.256, uh, which is here, 97.256. Uh, we can go into that. And what we have here, all of these different files, which will tell us about the command, how it was executed, how it began, if there's any errors, the log, 
um, everything you might need to know. Um, so there's nothing there in the begin. Um, this is effectively the error. So we have things about like the, the hashes that are generated to check that um, everything is the same. Um, a lot of information in there about um, basically error logging. Um, we have the uh, log file. Again, this is a lot of information about what would be printed to um, your terminal normally. Um, all of this is kept here in the log file. Um, this is also um, what is given as the output. Um, and here is the command that was run. So here we have a few things that are happening under the hood with Nextflow um, and how this was actually executed and everything was staged and launched. And here we have the command.sh. This is actually what was included as a part of the script block. Um, if you do have failing processes or failing tasks, um, this is a really great um, place to um, find out about um, what was executed and actually try and debug it. Um, it is probably slightly more advanced um, sort of understanding, but um, everyone needs to start somewhere. So I do encourage you to um, explore that. Um, one thing that you can see here as well is that using tree, uh, we can look at the structure of all these files. Um, and what's actually happening is that here we have some links. So this is when the data is being brought in to be staged. So it's being brought into this, this directory, this folder. Um, it is being linked in so that when the command.sh, for example, is executed, um, the file will be there to be used as a part of this process. Um, that's all quite a, a, a roundabout way, um, but there's more information um, about sort of what I've said here, um, about how you can look at the sort of different exit codes and the command.begin and um, things like that. Um, you can ask to ignore errors. Um, so if you are, something is failing and you just want it to sort of skip that process and carry on with the rest of your pipeline, um, you can do that with stuff like um, error strategy ignore. Um, this is something you can sort of set here um, as a directive um, for every process that you're using um, or here um, as a part of the configuration file as well. Um, here, again, this is another directive. We could also include this as a part of um, your configuration. So here it's, it's a part of the process. Um, it's just saying error strategy retry. So if it fails, it would, it would try again. Um, you can also include things like max retry so that um, you can just keep you trying up to a certain number of times. And then after that certain number, it might just um, turn off. So a situation like this would be that resources on your HPC might be allocated or unavailable when it tried to launch um, or something was taken away or um, when it was launching and it failed. Um, so you might just have to retry it again um, and it would work. Here, um, you can sort of set these uh, kind of evolving um, situations. So you can like retry with back off, for example, um, where you can change the amount of resources allocated um, based on a, a error strategy. So it fails, okay, but it doesn't have enough memory. I want to retry again uh, with, with um, more resources as an example. Uh, again, we sort of touched on this a little bit as well, um, which is, um, dynamic uh, resource allocation. So yeah, two gigabytes per task attempt. Um, again, so if something fails, you just retry it again straight away um, with the retry strategy or error strategy um, to actually just try and add more resource to see if that would get your analysis over the line. Okay, um, so that's kind of everything as part of this training material. What we'll do now is um, go back and look at um, next slow tower in slightly more detail. Okay, so for the next 30 minutes or so, we'll talk about how you can get started with Nextflow Tower. First of all, some basic concepts. So what is Nextflow Tower? Nextflow Tower is the centralized command post for data management and pipelines. It brings monitoring, logging, and observability to distributed workflows and simplifies the deployment of pipelines at any cloud cluster or laptop. Some of the core features of Nextflow Tower include the launching of pre-configured pipelines with ease, programmatic integration to meet the needs of organizations, publishing pipelines to shared workspaces, as well as the management of infrastructure uh, required to run data analysis at scale. What all of this is kind of alluding to is that a lot of the things that we've already talked about uh, that you can do with Nextflow, such as managing your source code, um, scaling to the cloud, as well as managing your software with things like Docker, you can do all of this as a part of Nextflow Tower as well um, in a slightly more intuitive and easy way. What I would like everyone to do is actually access um, the Tower website. So you can click on the sign up link here and this will take us to the Tower website.
what you'll find here, um, you'll land on this overview page and there's a lot of extra information about Nextflow like Tower and how it might be able to um, support the execution of your pipelines. So here, for example, there's information about pr improved productivity, uh, remove complexity, reduce cost, and simplify compliance. And there's a lot of really valuable information here on this sort of main web page. Um, you can scroll down and read this in your own time. Um, but I do really encourage you to come back um, and have a, have a real browse around the website and understand all of the features and exactly how they work. Um, here, for example, is some information about the compute platforms. Um, so the automatic provision, manage, and scale compute environments in the cloud. Um, and you can do all of this through Nextflow Tower, um, as well as manage your container technologies and your source code. Right down here at the bottom of the page is actually a full list um, of the uh, features of Nextflow Tower. And what I wanted to draw your attention to as well is down here under Learn, um, there is a number of other resources that you might be interested in for um, understanding Nextflow. Um, but here on the, the blog site is some really nice extended pieces um, about some of the features of Nextflow Tower um, and how you can sort of integrate Nextflow, um, some of the sort of other products um, from Skira, such as the, the Fusion file system, um, how these can be all in integrated into your pipeline um, and run using things like Nextflow Tower. Okay, so scrolling back up to the top, um, I also wanted to show you here just under pricing that what we're doing today is under Tower Cloud Free. Um, so it has all of these features. Um, you don't have to pay for any of this, um, but there are just some limited quotas and um, there are a few things that are missing um, compared to the Tower Cloud Professional and Tower uh, Enterprise. Um, and if you are interested in those or sort of what they might offer, um, I'm sure Sakira will be very happy to hear from you. Um, okay, so what I would like everyone to do is sign up. So here in the top left-hand corner of the page, we have the sign up button and you can click on that. And then it'll take you to this tower page here. Um, you have two options, or I guess three options to sign in. Um, you can either use your GitHub or Google account, um, or of course you could sign up with your email. Um, as most of you will be using the GitPod environment, I think the GitHub um, link is easiest for everyone. So if we all click on that, you can access this space. What you should land on is this community showcase. So in here, there is a launch pad um, with access to a lot of the NF core repositories. Um, and we can launch and play around with these um, to understand what Nextflow Tower can do. Um, and we'll do this very shortly. However, what I would like to start with is actually the training material um, over here under 12.2 usage. Um, we will look at how you can launch your pipeline from the command line and then monitor it using Tower. So this is one of the features of Tower is that you can monitor uh, your pipelines. So back here in the Nextflow Tower um, window, over here in the top right-hand corner, you'll see a picture um, that you probably have as your profile picture for Git or Google or whatever, whatever else you've used to sign in. We can look at the drop-down window and go to your tokens. Here, we have the option to access tokens and you can add a token. Over here on the right, there's this button that says add token. I want you to click on that and then you can create a token name. I'm just gonna call this my demo. Um, so it's nice and easy for me to identify. I can click add. And it'll create this, um, this token that will allow us to connect Nextflow to Tower using the Tower Access Token environment variable um, in our um, GitPod environment. So going back here to the training material, um, you can scroll down a little bit and you can see here you can export this token to your environment. So here we have export Tower Access Token equals. I'm going to copy that and put that here into my GitPod environment. I'll go back here and copy this entire token and enter it here to export it and hit enter. One thing is um, please don't export this version of Nextflow. This is a little bit old. Um, I think this would now break if we were to try and include this. Um, if you've already done this by mistake, uh, if you go back here to environmental setup right at the bottom, it'll show you the version of Nextflow that I'm using. Um, and I think it'll be best for everyone to use as a part of uh, this training. Okay, so we've now exported this token. So the Tower Access token is now in our environment in Gitpod. What we will also do is use a Tower Workspace ID. What I will do now is set up an organization and a workspace for my organization. So here, again, in the top right-hand corner, um, we can go down to your organizations. You'll see I'm a part of the community, which you'd also be part of here. I'm also part of Secure Labs. Um, what I would like to do is add an organization. I can give this a name. I'm going to call it my demo. 
Um, you'll see here that this formats with an underscore automatically. I'm just going to change that to a lowercase as well. Um, what you'll see here is we have options to um, have full names, descriptions, locations, websites, um, logos. So if you're setting up an organization, um, so wherever you work, for example, um, you could include a lot more information here to make it um, more identifiable for you and others. I can click add. You can see that this is now being created here. So I have my demo organization under the organization's uh, sort of window. I can enter that. Now what I will do is create a workspace. I can do this by clicking on the add workspace button. Um, here I can say, um, I call this work one. Um, I'm going to call this work space one. You can imagine that if you were um, in, a, in a group or an environment where you needed to have different workspaces for different projects, different jobs, um, this is quite a powerful way to um, create organizations and organize the workspaces um, that you may need access to or allow others access to. Um, I'm just going to call this share so that others can see it. Um, and here, so now we have work one with the with the full name workspace one. We've generated this ID. Um, this will become why we have this will become more apparent very shortly. But back here in the documentation, I'm going to export the tower workspace ID. So I'm going to copy that. In my Git pod window, I'm going to add um, that here. And then I'm going to copy out this ID. And oh, wrong one again. And I'm going to put that there. So now I've exported both my tower access token and my tower workspace ID. And as a reminder, um, you can do both of these things by creating an organization here and creating a token here. So this is where um, the things get really cool. So what we can do is we can run a pipeline from the command line from Gitpod in this environment. So we can use Nextflow run hello. And all we have to do is add this with Tower. And what that'll do is it'll send the run information to Tower and we can monitor it there. So back here in Gitpod, I'm going to run hello.nf with Tower. Um, you'll see that I still have this um, hello.nf. I can click enter. What you'll see is next slide is running. It has given it um, a name, so Modest Franklin, as well as this revision number. And you can see that we can now monitor the, flow, the execution with Nextflow Tower using this address. So I'm going to click on that and open it. And what you can see now in Nextflow Tower, this is my account. It could find this because of my access token and workspace um, ID. So this is in my, my demo workspace one. I have all the information about this run. So we can see what the command line was. Down here in general, we can see um, all this information uh, that you could normally access in the command line, but it's been organized and neatly stored here as a part of uh, Nextflow Tower. We can see that we have uh, all of the, uh, the tasks, the, the processes that have been submitted uh, have succeeded. We can see those processes there, what they were. We can see all the aggregated stats of this run. So the wall time, the CPU time, the total memory, um, the read and write, and the estimated costs. Um, this becomes more relevant if you're running on the cloud. Uh, we have the load, so the cores and tasks, the memory efficiency, the CPU efficiency, um, all the different tasks that were executed. So here we've got split letters once and the convert to upper twice because that was uh, two separate tasks. We have all the information about this run. So here we have chunk AA. Down here we have uh, chunk AB. All the information that you'd normally be able to access in the command line, um, you could actually access here. And it's really intuitive um, and easy to sort of find and interact with way. Um, down here we have more information about the, the metrics, so the raw CPU usage, so it was allocated and used, um, about the memory as well as the job duration. Um, so as you can see, if you are running a larger pipeline, especially at scale, and you're trying to understand what's happening, um, where and when and what was done, um, this is a really powerful um, and easy way of actually measuring um, and viewing what has happened in your pipeline. Um, here we can view the parameters. So if you have a lot of parameters, um, this is a really nice way of, of viewing it. Um, we have configuration here, so all the configuration files. Um, and we also have... Uh, the data sets, for example, so you can actually store and include data sets here as a part of, or data set information um, in, in Nextflow Tower, as well as reports. Um, we'll come back and view this as a part of um, actually running one of the community showcase pipelines. 
Um, but what I wanted to show is just to press a very quick introduction to this. Um, what we can do is actually go back to the GitPod environment now and run something a little bit more complicated. So um, as you'll remember, and as one of the scripts that we've revisited a few times, we've got script seven, which is that proof of concept RNA seq pipeline, which we have developed. We're going to run this again, but with tower. This will create another link like this, but we can also uh, go back here to our workspace, uh, my demo, my workspace. We can look at the runs, and what you can see is that this has already been generated and is running. So again, we can see what has run. So here we have with tower, we have all of the same information that we've already viewed looking at the hello.nf. Um, this is already run, and we've got some new aggregated stats, um, as well as information about all the different pieces of this run. Again, um, as I've already shown, you can go in here and actually access all of that run information. So every task, what was there, um, and how it was executed. So uh, what I'm, I'm hoping um, you're starting to see is that next row tower is a really nice way that you can actually control, not necessarily control in this uh, in this case, but manage um, or view the, your runs uh, from, from the command line. Okay, um, so going back to the training material, um, you'll see that we've basically got um, to the end of 12.2.1. Um, um, and if anything, we've actually gone a little bit into 12.2.2. Um, there is a lot of extra information here, um, and you can work through this as well if you want. Uh, but I actually think the easiest thing to do is going over to um, Nexo Tower and exploring the uh, community showcase and then going back to our new organization and looking at how you might set some of this up for yourself. So here on the community, we have the community organization and we have the show a case workspace um, and all these pipelines that have been added um, already. You can quickly and easily launch these using the launch button. So I'm going to use the RNA seq as an example, and we can quickly hit the launch button. What that'll do is bring up a full list of parameters. So this will be the same types of parameters that we've shown as a part of session two when we're looking at the NF core pipelines, um, that parameter JSON file. Um, all of that information is included here. Um, and you can quickly and easily uh, write this into the uh, pipeline. So you can set your, your output directory to results, for example. You could add an email, a title of your, your multi-QC file. All of the parameters that are included in that pipeline are going to be included in that parameters um, file with all the information that we've generated using that NF um, schema. Uh, it's probably the proper description. Um, can be accessed here. If you are happy with that, you can very quickly and easily launch. So what this will do now is launch this um, using uh, the compute environments and credentials that we already have um, available here. You can see here that I've launched as basically exactly the same pipeline previously, and that has already run in 24 minutes. So while that is still submitting, um, you can see here, this is a slightly more complicated example compared to what we've done from the command line from Gitpod. But you can see here that this was run, so this was run directly from GitHub. We have a GitHub address here. We have the name, we have a parameters file um, with tower, the version, the revision that we're using, the test profile, um, as well as the latest flag. All of this is run. We have all the information where the work directory was. Um, in this case, it is run on AWS batch using the AWS batch um, executor. All of this information, all of the different jobs, uh, processes rather, um, are listed here. We have all the information again about the wall time, the CPU time, the memory used, um, all the information about the read and write, um, as well as an estimated cost. This is um, only an estimation, but it does give you an idea of how much this would have cost um, based on the amount of virtual environments um, that were generated for uh, this run. Um, it was a more complicated than that, but I just wanted to point out this is an estimate rather than exact cost. Uh, here, again, all this information um, that we've already sort of looked at. Uh, one other thing we can look at here, for example, though, is that you can actually start filtering um, for information. So I could look at, you know, for example, the wild type samples, um, and I can go in here and look at exactly what happened for a particular sample um, as a part of the pipeline. You can also see here that every process, um, you can look at the different CPU usage um, as well as memory usage. Um, and the point of this is that you can actually understand where your resources were allocated, what processes took longer, what took less, uh, where those resources were allocated. Um, that's all very, very cool. 
Um, again, you can see that with like the full list of parameters, the configuration file, um, in this case, the data set, um, you can store um, information about data sets on NextFlow Tower. And we have information about that here. In this case, it's the sample sheet. Um, as a part of this as well, you can have your compute environments. Um, we'll look at how you can set this up very shortly as well. But um, here we've already got some pre-configured compute environments, which are both AWS. Um, so when this is being executed, you can specify which um, environment you want to use. Um, and then you can have all this pre-configured and loaded and just quickly and easily click on this um, when you are in the launch pad. Um, same with credentials, you can store credentials here. So this might be um, the keys that you use to get into your Git pod, uh, you see your GitHub account, for example, or a private repository um, for your Docker files. Um, all of this is available here uh, to store. You can store all of this here. Um, you can also do that with different secrets. So if you're accessing things like MCBI, um, have some pipeline secrets, um, they can be stored here. Um, and it's a really safe way because um, everything's encrypted. Um, and hidden away so that you don't need to worry about security. Um, here, um, right at the end, we have participants in this, this workspace. Um, so here, for example, you can see that we've got a number of different team members that have been added. Um, they have different permissions, and based on those permissions, um, they will be able to have different privileges for uh, creating, running um, pipelines and, and workflows. Um, going back here to the runs, um, you can see that this is still submitted. So because this is getting sent to AWS, it is just asking for those resources. Um, but this will take a little bit more time to run. So we might just leave that running in the background. Um, you can see that this is ticking over um, as we speak. Going back to uh, my workspace, so my demo uh, workspace, work one, you can see all of this in a slightly different way. So this is a completely new environment, and this is probably what you would be faced with um, if you were setting this up for the first time by yourself. You can see here that you can add pipelines. So this is much like those NF Core pipelines that we've already added. You could add this, you can give it a name, a description, um, any labels that you might want. Um, you can create labels to um, tag these pipelines, make them um, easily findable. You could set a compute environment. So these are the environments that you can also set up um, here. Uh, we'll come to that very shortly. Uh, the pipeline to launch. So here, for example, you can actually specify um, a pipeline that you would like to run. This is straight from GitHub. Um, if you're doing it from a um, private repository, you would require the credentials, um, but you can add in your pipelines um, here. You can add revision numbers, work directories, config profiles, pipeline parameters, um, everything you can imagine can be controlled here as a part of uh, Nextflow Tower. Um, here we can see the runs that have already run. So this is uh, where the pipelines have run. If I had a launch uh, pipeline from here, um, this would end up in here as well. Um, but as you can see, we can quickly and easily access these previous runs, uh, see what was run, see how it was run. Um, and this will help us keep track of, of the runs that we've done in the past, um, especially if we do come back to something later and have um, forgotten uh, where something is or how it was run or what parameters were used. Um, this is a really great way of storing that information. Here we have actions. So the actions um, are basically automatic um, executions. Um, from third-party integrations. So here, for example, you could have um, event triggers such as um, code commits or webhooks. So as an example of that, if your pipeline has been updated on your Git repository, you could have um, basically an action here that would ask, um, because it's been updated, can you please run it again with this test data set, um, which you could also have stored here in the data sets. Um, so that's just quite a really nice way. Um, it's quite a common way of storing and checking your pipelines are running and that nothing's broken. Um, as you sort of update them in, in your code repository. Um, as we mentioned, data sets. So you can include data sets here. You can add a data set uh, with a name, description, um, some sort of sample sheet that would specify what samples uh, you would like to include in that run. Uh, the compute environments, which I've mentioned a couple of times already. So this is where you can set up the compute environments that you want to use with Nexo Tower. So here we have um, a full list of options. So a lot of cloud providers, HPC options uh, that you can use. Um, if you were to click on one of these, for example, you can see that you've got um, everything that you need to actually include. Um, so it just it helps you um, include all this information without having to sort of guess and do all this in the command line. Here, for example, you could change um, the region uh, that you're running this from, um, any work directories, and you can also add things like Wave Containers um, and Fusion, which are other um, 
sort of products um, that you might um, want to include. Um, all of these are available. Um, if you go looking around on the website, um, things like Fusion and Wave, relatively new, um, but they are both uh, really worthwhile exploring as well. Um, of course, more options, um, how you can configure this, such as using Batch Forge, um, Spot Instances, um, a number of other um, options that you might be interested in, um, as well as how you want to stage environment and advanced options down there as well. Moving along the top two credentials, um, again, you can just add credentials um, to um, allow you to run these. So for example, you could use, um, you know, if we're setting up an AWS environment, you'd probably need to um, have your credentials stored in here and make things a lot easier. Um, so that you could just kind of link um, your compute environment with your credentials and run that quite quickly and easily. Um, of course, as already mentioned, we've got the pipeline secrets. You can add participants. So this is how you would um, add other, other group members um, to be able to access and view your runs, um, as well as some other workspace settings. Going back to the community workspace, um, here we have the showcase still. Um, here under runs, you can see what's already been run. You can see this is now running. Um, we can see that this is the, again, this is what was run. So there are five jobs have been submitted, but none have succeeded yet. And we have a lot of information um, here about the status of those. And of course, we can always go in and view them here, um, what has been run and how it is going. Okay, so that's a lot of information quite quickly. One feature I would like to go back and show you though is the optimization of a workflow. So here under run under the community workspace, what you might notice is that some of these have this optimization available um, flag. So as a part of uh, Nextflow Tower, you can look at the optimization of a particular pipeline. So if you were to uh, look at um, this run here, for example, you'll see here you have this optimization available. So here, this is basically a uh, parameters file which has been generated with optimized resources. So based on the run that was um, done previously, what Nextflow Tower is doing is looking at the resources that were allocated and what was actually used, um, and then giving you an optimized configuration so that when you run this again, um, you can have some pretty serious cost savings. So if you were to run this again, um, you could um, copy this out and use this as a, um, a parameter, um, but you could also use this um, optimized configuration um, as a part of this. Um, again, you can go back and look at the optimization there. Um, so if you were to run this again, you can um, you can do this. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything in there that we need to really talk about. Um, but as you can see, there's um, oh, reports. Apologies, I've missed this. Um, so when you go back here, um, we'll go to runs. Uh, something I haven't shown you is um, the reports. So you can specify. Um, of course, you've got the execution log, but the reports. Um, so these are reports that you can specify in a file in your repository. Um, you can tell it what reports you'd like to generate and to be included as a part of Tower. Um, here, for example, you look at the MultiQC report. Um, this is where it is, and all the information about your run is, is in here. So you can jump around um, and look at all that quite quickly um, and easily. So you'll keep hearing me say quickly and easily, um, but I think that's just one of the, the you know, it's, it's really what Tower does for me. It makes it as quick and easy to view uh, my runs and um, makes it easy to um, go back and find out what I did, what parameters were used, um, and it really, uh, what I think is a fantastic way. Okay, um, so I think that will keep running now in the background. I mean, you can see it's still running. It'll probably take around 24 minutes to run. Um, like I said, you can go back through some of these pipelines. You can um, optimize them um, if the resources were too high or too low. Um, so if you go back and relaunch this, um, you can take the optimization and use that as a part of the, the relaunch, uh, like I've just shown. OK. So you just specify it there using the optimization. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show you as a part of uh, Nextflow Tower. Um, I do really encourage you to um, come back here and have a look around. Um, there are some features I haven't talked about extensively, such as um, labels. So for example, um, you know, if you were to uh, go to Launchpad and go to um, this ChipSeq, 
Um, you can do things like add labels, which can help with costing and sort of um, adding things back. Um, you can't do this here as a part of the uh, community workspace, but in your own organization, um, if you had high privileges, you can. Um, okay, uh, like I said, I think um, that is where I will leave it um, today. Um, please do come and have a look around. Um, if you do have more questions about Tower, um, or if you're thinking this would be useful at your institution, I'm sure the Secure team would be very happy to uh, hear from you. So just to finish off, um, we do have some notes here about API, so you can sort of build on top of Tower um, if you wanted to, um, to do that. So there's a lot of information here about how you can um, sort of integrate um, Tower um, with other software. Um, we've talked about workspaces and organizations. And yeah, so that's that's the end of the training material.